Yes. So this meeting is being recorded. Let me just start sharing. Okay. okay hold on. Uh, Okay, do people see the slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, uh, this is the uh, a bit uh, um, uh, interesting starting uh, virtual interim for the IoT operations working group. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm welcoming everybody here. This is the uh, First virtual interim meeting, we have four presentations for today. And please note, uh, as you probably already heard right now, uh, this meeting is being recorded. Next slide. So we have the note well. I hope everybody is familiar with it. There's some code of conduct here. Uh, the links on the slide deck shared on the data tracker uh, uh, show basically everything of interest, especially BCP79 and BCC78, which is about the IPR. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I heard we already have some uh, minute takers here today. And uh, are we suitable stacked and stuffed with uh, minute takers, Alexei? Yes, I believe so. Um, Elliot said he will do the first part and Robert is doing later. Excellent. Thank you. Um, someone have a look at the chat. If people can uh, just watch Code AMD and help out if there are any corrections yeah. and just do the edits there, that would be much appreciated as well. Okay, so uh, we are we are closing into the agenda items. So we can we can quickly skim through these. Um, there are uh, four presentations for today. It's taking about an hour, um, roughly a quarter hour every presentation here. If this is getting to be working soon, so um, so that's the plan. And then we can have some open discussion time about the uh, specific items afterwards. If the presenters leave time for that in their own time frame, we can have some immediate questions being addressed uh, ad hoc. Um, again, there will be time after the presentation block, and then um, we are we are trying to steer the discussion a little bit uh, at, the, at the half mile mark here and then uh, uh, go to uh, the phrasing of some deliverables because this working group started with a very specific first deliverable and that is creating the actual deliverables. And uh, so we are going to focus that on the second half of the open discussion time, which is basically the second hour of the two hour, two hour meeting here. So now we have the challenge of uh, what do we do next with this uh, weird uh, thing that some of the presenters and maybe even some other um, participants are not able to join here right now? Rob, you highlighted that you tr try to start your an alternative WebEx. That that succeed, or are you listening in right now to hear my question? Because I hear that other items do work so Carson set up his own webex and maybe it's on me i actually do not see how i can fail at that but um uh, it seems that webex in general should be working and that uh, it's only for a few that it doesn't so rob can you hear us or me which does not seem to be the case so that's an interesting conundrum. If Rob is not able to set up a WebEx right now, please bear with me for a minute. And maybe if Carson WebEx works, maybe we just do that. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah, we can yes. hear you now. Hi, Rob. Yeah, sorry, I am in the, busy, in the process of trying to set up the WebEx. My laptop is going at a crawl, though, trying to run both these at the same time. So I have got one created. I will share a link and then see if that works. But um... yeah. I will try to peel that link out of the chat. One moment, and then I haven't shared a link quickly. yet. 
And again, I'm very sorry for the inconvenience. I hope that is on me and that is not a general problem. But I actually can't tell. I think just I'll carry on for the moment while I try and to a point where I can get this going. Oh, wait a minute. It's just not this link. So I would like to have the uh, presentations in sequence. Uh, Tim, do you have an opinion on this? Because you are second in line after Karsten. Do you rely a little bit on his input uh, for your presentation? No, I, I can go ahead and start for uh, ahead of time. It would it would have been nice to, to to follow Karsten, but but there's no no reason I can't go ahead and start now. So. So um, so I actually as you probably can tell I am not Paul Watrovsky um, or Susan Symington. Uh, they are actually the experts uh, in, on our team uh, on this, this project, but for various reasons, uh, it, this one, you, you're stuck with me today. Um, what I would like to talk to, is a, uh, to you all about is a project that's been going on at a small component of NIST called the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, or NCCOE, where we work um, very collaboratively uh, with industry to do demonstration projects to try to accelerate the adoption of security technologies. So this is a, a talk about a trusted IoT device onboarding. We says taxonomy, maybe it's really an ontology. Um, uh, we're not always precise with our use of our own language. Um, but let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'm going to run through a little background on what, why we did this project in the first place, what, what's motivating us, and then I'm going to talk about um, the, the drivers, the, 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 then the paper itself that I would hope I'm going to be able to uh, inspire some of you to go and read. Um, I'm going to talk about the onboarding overview and the concepts as we see this area. And then a little brief advertisement for a project that the NCCOE will be spinning up in the near future. Next slide, please. So the NCCOE has been working for more than 18 months now to prepare for a project on trusted IoT device onboarding. This actually stems back to a project that we did on MUD, which I think a lot of you are probably familiar with. When we started to work on MUD, when we worked with our, our, our partners, they said, you know, MUD is important, but so is the onboarding piece they kind of work together, they strengthen each other. Um, and we ended up doing MUD first because it was more mature, but we've been working with stakeholders. We recognized that this was an important project area, and we've been working on this for quite a while, including a workshop that we had with stakeholders. Um, I want to say, unlike a lot of the talks that you're going to get here, um, there is no internet draft. We haven't submitted this as an internet draft, and we don't really plan to. We're hoping that, you know, we've done a lot of legwork here and that you'll find this work useful and just use it. Uh, it is important to us to stay aligned. And so, um, you know, we hope people will read it and let us know if you perceive any conflicts. Next, please. So, we see trusted layer network layer onboarding where this is what our term is for, for a specific component of this. Um, we see this as really crucial uh, both to protect the devices from being taken over by the wrong networks and to protect networks from having devices connect up that really shouldn't be there. Um, but more than that, we see this as important for the rest of the life cycle. Um, we're really looking at the NCCOE at how do we make technologies, um, cybersecurity technologies, how do we help businesses or enterprises integrate them into their life cycle so they really get value out of them, so they want to actually um, pr provide these. Um, there's a lot of work going on, I think you're, familiar probably with, with some of the different pieces and others will get talked about today. Uh, a lot of different projects in various SDOs um, 
on onboarding solutions. And the characteristics and the capabilities, they're different. And so we ended up where we were trying to compare apples and oranges. And we felt we needed, we needed something, we needed a common uh, a, a set of words, we needed a common framework to be able to say, oh, this onboarding solution provides this feature, this uh, another onboarding solution does not. You also, you'll see, we talk about trust, trusted onboarding. Um, we're very focused on what are the security characteristics that you're going to get from this, this uh, from, from onboarding if you invest in it. Next slide, please. So there is an 88 page paper online on the URL here. Also, there's a slide at the end uh, uh, that has uh, all of the, the URLs again, but we developed this paper 88 pages, it goes through onboarding and sort of what is it generically? What does it mean? What are the, the functional roles that have to be implemented? Um, what it, how does it fit into the greater life cycle of, of, of these devices? Um, we look at it from the user point of view, the manufacturer's point of view, the service provider. Um, we, we do recommend a set of security capabilities. So there's a lot of material in here. In my 15 minutes, I'm not even going to attempt to go through all of it. I just wanted you to have an idea of what the landscape is. Next slide, please. So we came to the conclusion that there were really two kinds of onboarding. There's the network layer onboarding where you're trying to get a device onto the network with a set of credentials so that the net so that the device can trust the the network and the network can trust the device there's also this application layer onboarding um, that is more about now that i have the device on board if it's changing if it would, how do i provision new applications new software how do i add new capabilities um, uh, and, and, and make all of this work. And all of this also then comes around to, to other parts of lifecycle management, like how do I transfer ownership of the device? How do I take it out of service? All of those pieces. That's why we have 88 pages. We cover all of that in the document. Uh, next slide, please. One of the really interesting things that we cover in our document that is a little different, I think, is that we cover what we're calling the supply chain phase of onboarding. Uh, because our focus is working with, um, uh, with vendors, with developers to demonstrate these new, th these new technologies, part of what we wanna be able to do at the end is say, if you wanna support this technology in your products, what are the things that you need to do? So this supply chain phase, and you know, this is a different use of the word supply, word supply chain. I, I don't know that that was our best decision, but what we're really saying is all of the tasks that have to happen to make devices ready to bring on uh, to the network to use to, to achieve trusted onboarding. There's a lot of materials that need to be uh, um, built into the system, uh, 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 installed on the system. There may be hardware features or uh, software features that need to be included in the overall design, certainly plenty of software. So this is what a lot of the document talks about. What is the supply chain phase? Next, please. The second is the world of use. If you're going, once the supply chain is done and a device has been uh, transferred to its first owner, what what are the onboarding things that may happen, you know, both at network layer and at the application layer? We want to be able to cover, you know, maintenance, repurposing, resale, um, periodic refresh. That's why what you're looking at there, um, you know, it's a it's a more complicated uh, um, picture than I think I had always thought of 18 months ago when we started this project. Next slide, please. We go, because we're looking at trusted, we, you know, 
National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. We are security focused. So there's a lot of security characteristics that we wanted to define, wanted to identify. Some of these we consider to be mandatory, others we consider to be um, a requirement for certain kinds of downstream features. You know, are we preparing to do other things during the life cycle? Um, this is just a partial list, um, but this is the kind of material that we have gone through in the document. Next slide, please. We look at this as enterprise use versus home use. Different kinds of characteristics are much more important in some scenarios, some environments than others. Um, so uh, I should say before we, we, we go to the next slide, uh, can we roll back to the previous slide for just a moment? While this is all about security characteristics and capabilities, I want to note, and that's the core of our focus. There are also a lot of security of, of non security characteristics and capabilities that are onboarding related that have to do with being able to handle other parts of the life cycle. Um, and so there's an even broader set of capabilities. And the interesting thing is we had to do those not because they were security relevant, but because they were relevant for making things operationally practical. Um, and so as an ops group, I wanted to say that there's more to it than just the security characteristics. So for your point of view, some of the things that I've left out, because frankly, as a security guy, they're less interesting to me, they may turn out to be very important in your group. So now back to the next slide. Um, I think everybody knows there's really kind of a dichotomy with a lot of IoT devices. Um, the world is different uh, for installing and maintaining uh, thermostats in my home and a thermostat at NIST. Um, the kinds of capabilities that are required or that are important may be very different. Um, you know, you really can't expect the home user to go through a lot of training to put in um, the, their new thermostat, where the folks that do the installation at NIST, because they're doing lots of buildings, that may be just fine if they have to do some training to really be able to do it. There's a lot of differences in how these things work, and actually it really affects onboarding as well. So um, we tried to go through all of that in the document as well. Next piece, next slide. So kind of came at this backwards because actually in some ways this slide should have been first. Why am I here? Why am I giving this presentation? Uh, some of our partners uh, that are involved in this group um, pointed out that the group has been looking at things like 2T TRG secure bootstrapping. And they said, hey, you know, you guys have put in a lot of legwork. We have one set of words that we've sort of agreed upon using when we're working with the NCCOE. Maybe they'd be valuable to the IoT ops group. Certainly would like if they need them to be using the same words. Why don't you come in and talk about this a little bit? So we went back and we looked and I did over the weekend, take a little bit of time looking at uh, T2 TRG secure bootstrapping. Um, one thing is that's a very nice, clear document. The scope is smaller than ours, um, but much easier to handle than, than, than the 88 pager that we've dropped on the world. Um, part of it is scope. The T2 TRG document, in my opinion, really looks at the options for what we're calling network layer onboarding. Um, the, my first observation, would be that um, my second observation would be that the recommendations, the core recommendations in the T2 TRG document on the use of the, firm, the, the words bootstrapping and the, the provisioning, configuring, they're actually pretty consistent, consistent with what we've called provisioning and bootstrapping. And I was actually really relieved to find there's some commonality in some of the core areas. So I don't think that. Um, you know, once I've come back in and looked that there's anything immediately broken between us and the, the 
T2, TRG. Uh, now, other people may read that and, and tell me things are a little different, um, but that was my initial uh, feedback on this. Um, the document goals are pretty different. Um, uh, that document is pretty agnostic about really what does it mean to do secure bootstrapping. Um, where we felt we had to, for the, our own purposes, we had to establish requirements. And that meant that there are some more features of onboarding that we specifically talk about. Um, and so that, that's kind of an interesting piece. Um, we do look at a bigger scope, a more generic model with, we have you know things like 16 functional roles, which I didn't list here. Um, we've got a robust list of characteristics both security and not that go throughout the life cycle. I guess from my point of view, what I would want to say is for this group, um, if in fact you find those, um, if, if, if there are more pieces that you'd like in this group uh, to have a common set of language on beyond what the secure bootstrapping document uh, has, we hope that you will look at our document as at least one source for actually um, uh, uh, getting that material. Um, so uh, we don't see, the, the last piece I would say is we looked briefly at RFC 8576. I didn't have time for an in-depth read, but I didn't find any particular conflict. So I'm hoping that we're at a position where if you will go and look at this document now, you will it, it, at least it'll be food for thought and you won't, we're not asking anyone to throw anything away. Next slide, please. This is the brief advertisement. Um, we are getting ready to spin up a project on um, IoT onboarding. Uh, we are going to be working with uh, vendors on a number of the different protocols that actually are described in the secure bootstrapping uh, 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 paper. Um, and we're going to be looking both at the, the network layer onboarding, but also at what other capabilities we can integrate so that we can actually secure that full device life cycle as we talk about in our document. So can we do application layer onboarding? Can we leverage MUD and make it make MUD stronger because of the onboarding? Can we do attestation? So we think we're in a good spot to cross pollinate and both with other projects and with other standards as they're being developed in the future. Next slide. This is our usual plan on where we are in the project timeline. We are just getting ready to really form teams. So if you are a vendor who produces products in this space and you're interested in uh, working with us, please keep an eye out for um, work from um, uh, at the NCCOE, uh, where uh, um, we're going to publish a federal register notice, we'll be able to form some teams, and we're going to do demonstration projects over the next 12 months or so, where we hope to prove that this technology really works. Uh, next slide, please. So I know that I've used up my time, and we're going to have question time later, uh, but we uh, we certainly are interested in, in everyone's feedback. You can send follow up email if I don't if we don't get to answer your question later in the session. And next slide. Uh, so the meeting materials will have uh, if you if you go to the meeting materials and download these slides, it has I think all the URLs that you will really need if you want to follow up on this work. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, I hope we'll get a chance to talk more about this later in the session. If there are some quick questions on this presentation specifically, um, please go ahead. Doesn't seem like we have any takers. Um, at this point, uh, um, Robert has provided me with another URL, which we can try. Um, shall I post it? 
Hey, Alexi, it just yeah. um, Miss Elliot, I, I apologize for interrupting. Um, do we know that we're still short people at this point? Uh, this is Hank. So uh, we have Carson who joined via mobile device, and I think the call-in user that is listed in the on the roster here is uh, uh, Michael. Is that true? Or was listed? I don't see a call-in user anymore. Michael Richardson is listed now in the participant ah, list. I see. So Excellent. of course yeah. you have every uh, have all your speakers. That is true. So Carsten, can you hear us or can you speak out? Because you could be now the second presentation with a slightly <laughs> updated sequence here. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. actually quite fine. Okay. So I'm using my phone right now and uh, there are some limitations to its connectivity, but I hope that doesn't get in, in the way uh, too much. So while, while you are setting up uh, the, the slides, um, the, the idea of my presentation is uh, to do something a bit different. We have a different perspective on this. So th there is absolutely amazing work in, in the list uh, document that Tim talked about. So I'm not trying to to somehow compete with that or come up with a, um, a document that would replace that or something uh, but uh, th there may be a, another approach that is also useful for uh, looking um, at this uh, subject okay can you go to the do next i slide? have the right one projected Karsten? it looks good to me okay good um yeah, so um, we we are we do have ongoing discussions in in the Think to Think research group about um, how how to address this field. So the the document uh, from Mohit that that uh, Tim briefly talked about um, is is uh, a work in progress. So it, it's an interesting snapshot, but it certainly will uh, move forward. And uh, the the term that uh, we seem to be converging on is really initial security setup because bootstrapping is uh, just one of the many terms um, so this this slide has a list of such um, terms and some of these seem to be more popular in the itf some of these seem to be more popular in other uh, places uh, but in the end this is all about the fact that uh, when iot environments are being uh, set up uh, things or devices uh, need to be set up as well. They they need to know their purpose in life, which is really the, the um, most important part. And of course, they need to know all about how to, to fulfill their purpose in life in a secure uh, way. And on the other hand, uh, the environment in which these uh, uh, devices are put, the digital environment, uh, also needs to know something about the devices uh, uh, so it can properly uh, support and, and interact with them. So part of the setup is security setup. Part of it is other kinds of setup, for instance, application uh, setup. And I think in reality, these cannot be fully uh, separated, but being able to do applications up in a, a setup in a secure way uh, already is, is uh, pretty um, interesting. So um, the, the security setup really can be described on, on three levels. Uh, one is uh, what what are actually the the parties? What are the players that uh, uh, need to know something and um, perform their their work in a secure uh, way? And uh, that there are parties that are only relevant during setup and and not during operation. And there, there are others uh, that that are only uh relevant during operation not during setup and there are uh, s some that are both uh, the second point is what is it that we actually are setting up and essentially uh, what we are doing is uh, we are instilling certain beliefs in in uh, the players that uh, participate or, or are later informed by the participants of um, the setup uh, so, looking a little bit more closely, what this, what these beliefs are, 
um, is probably going to be a, a, a key uh, part to, to fully understanding the various uh, setup processes. And then, of course, there are the, the processes themselves, um, the, the sequences of events and, and, and the interactions that uh, lead to the uh, setup. Next slide. So what we want to do is uh, go a little bit uh, from the, the phenomenology that we have at the moment. So we can look at a number of, of uh, setup mechanisms and uh, try to, to derive their properties uh, by describing uh, them to an actual taxonomy. So we have terms for the various approaches and results and can describe uh, setup mechanisms uh, in those uh, terms. So Tim has already introduced the secure bootstrapping uh, document. Again, I think in the end, we will need to be able to, to talk about types and instances of players, uh, the, the beliefs and uh, the uh, processes. Next slide. Um, so th th there are two obvious players, the, the thing itself, the device and the environment. Um, actually, if you look more closely, the, the thing uh, might have split personalities. So that, that actually needs to be uh, modeled, but we are not currently doing that in, in, in the document. But I think in the end, uh, we need to be able to talk about um, partitions of things and, and shielded uh, parts like the trusted execution environments um, uh, and so on to fully describe uh, setup processes. So um, for now, let's just assume that we have a device. And on the other side, the environment uh, obviously is highly structured. And uh, so far, I think we, we have been able to identify the network, uh, the application, and uh, maybe something like a platform, which, which is essentially the, the application layer network. Um, to a certain extent. So some of the considerations of the network setup apply there uh, and also some uh, considerations of the applica application setup apply there. What's interesting about these players is that they are usually controlled by uh, different entities or by entities that could be different. And uh, some of the flavors of, of the, the setup processes that um, we are looking at uh, differ in how, uh, how well they actually can act uh, in an environment where these uh, um, owners are the same or are uh, different. So that, that's a very important uh, part. And of course, we, we cannot only talk about owners or controllers of the uh, environment. We can also talk about owners and controllers of the device. And uh, of course, we have uh, uh, all identified that there is probably something like an owner and uh, probably something like a manufacturer. And these are two, two identifiable roles that need to interact with the device. And we have uh, additional roles like facilitators and, and uh, so on that also need to be part uh, of the model. So that, that's the uh, first part and, and uh, next slide. Um, now let's look at the, the interaction uh, between um, the device and, and the environment. Um, it turns out that uh, a device uh, usually has uh, some identities and, and uh, Michael Richardson has a document that he's going to talk about that talks more about these identities. I think the important observation is that we have more than one identity and uh, these entity identities are often directed identities. So they, they are meant to be used in a specific context. Um, and these identities are often supported by roots of trust, uh, which are in the uh, device and uh, es essentially allow the device to uh, authenticate uh, th that is, it is having these identities. Uh, the other thing that the device has is some uh, trust anchors. Um, this is confusing terminology because trust anchors are what, what is usually called uh, root certificates. Um, and uh, But they, they are different from the roots of trust. I think most of you are, are familiar with this uh, confusion. 
Anyway, so the device has some, some trust anchors, uh, but really talking about trust anchors is, is weird because uh, trust always relates with respect to a, a certain assumption about what the, the other party is going to do. So in, in the end, um, you, are, you are not trusting someone uh, to, to life and death usually, but uh, you have specific authorizations. And the interesting thing is that we have three kinds of authorizations that we don't have good terms for yet. So th there are authorizations that allow the device to do something. That's actually often forgotten. Uh, the, the owner of the device has certain plans uh, with the device and the, the owner needs to, to uh, indicate their um, authorization information to the device. So the, the owner tells the device, hey, there's this network over there and you are authorized to join that, that network. So it usually does that in a complicated way that we describe by onboarding, but, but in the end, it's the authorization that is part of the belief that is instilled. So at the end of the setup process, the device A believes that its owner allows it uh, to, to use a particular network or to do some other X. Um, then, of course, we have the authorizations on the other side in, in the environment where some other player um, has uh, uh, the belief that uh, its controlling entity allows the, the holder of an identity A to do Y. Um, so th this is a little bit complicated, but th that's the nature of the authorizations that they have these uh, three different uh, components. And of course, the, there are also um, uh, specific authorizations on a, a device. Uh, so a device A might allow holder of identity B to do uh, Z. So these are really the beliefs that should be the, the result of the uh, initial security uh, setup. And it would be great if we had a, a better way to describe uh, these uh, beliefs in, in a way that uh, transcends uh, different terminology uh, systems. Next slide. Um, so the, the, the milestones that we usually talk about uh, are network onboarding, platform onboarding and, and application um, onboarding. Uh, sometimes you don't need application onboarding because the application never actually talks to the device, but uh, talks to the platform. And in that case, you just have a platform um, uh, onboarding. Um, yeah, and, and the fun part, of course, is that network un onboarding requires a network. Uh, so um, we, we have this problem that is often described by the term uh, bootstrapping. Next slide. So this is the, the part where the, the device is actually doing something useful. And then we have the other part, which is about controlling the device and, and owning uh, the device. And uh, clearly a device has someone who is responsible for setting its policies. Uh, we don't have a exceedingly, exceedingly good term for that. We call it overseeing principle sometimes. Uh, let's call it owner for now, even though it's uh, very clear that the overseeing principle is not always the legal owner uh, of the device. And then we have an original owner which we sometimes call manufacturer, even though it, it's becoming much less likely that the original owner actually is the manufacturer. Um, it's more like the entity the, the device was manufactured for. And that plays a role. And it's interesting to see which, which part of the role is retained over the, the life cycle and which part is uh, swapped out. And then the device has uh, special relationships uh, to other entities that uh, I summarize under the term facilitator, which, which may not be a very sharp term, but let's use it uh, for now. Uh, so these are entities that are mediating uh, the, the owner control uh, over the device. So it might be the smartphone of the installer or maybe an installer device that the installer um, uses or some, some other entities like uh, uh, MASA or, or other uh, uh, sites that have been set up to facilitate uh, the various uh, processes. Next slide. And here again, we have uh, lots of interesting milestones, uh, two of which 
uh, require some some very specific uh, thinking. One is the ownership transfer, which is a little bit of a euphemism because it's not actually happening in most cases. So the, the new owner gains some control, the original owner also retains some uh, control and also authorizations that, that had been issued to the device uh, remain in place or parts of them remain in place. And the other important milestone is the software update and, and we have a whole working group uh, working with that. Um, so in, in most environments, the software, and the software provider has full control. Um, so essentially the, the owners and original owners are delegating uh, some, some responsibilities to the, the software provider. And that is only limited by, by hardware shields and, and attestation. Uh, but there, there are other milestones in, in the device life and Tim actually uh, had a, a figure from RFC 8576 on, on his slides that I don't need to repeat. Uh, so next slide. Um, so what are the, the processes? The, the processes really all are about installing authorization, almost all of them are about installing authorizations. Um, so uh, these may be derived from a chain of authorizations. They may be derived from authorizations and additional assertions made by someone who's authorized to make these assertions, or they also can be obtained from a leap of faith. Um, so uh, some, some form of bootstrapping is required and uh, leap of faith or uh, sometimes uh, uh, physical access uh, is, is used to authorize uh, certain uh, authorization installations. So that, that's the part that works on the device. Then we have the, the mirror in, in the environment, the network, the platform, the application, where also some authorization is um, installed, uh, usually based on an identity uh, of the uh, device. And then of course, we have to be able to remove authorizations. Uh, we have factory set processes in some cases. And uh, of course that need to, needs to be authorized uh, again. And finally, a uh, part of the processes that is not about authorizations um, is uh, creating identities that are then used in the authorizations. So creating a, a temporary key or something like that, uh, that is a process that, that may be very important uh, to, for instance, to preserve uh, privacy uh, properties. Next slide. Um, it turns out that uh, the, the various uh, um, security setup mechanisms uh, can be described in terms of certain flavors. So for instance, the, the uh, old dichotomy of, of managed versus unmanaged, that, that works a bit here in this place. Um, but uh, as I said, a very important aspect is uh, who controls what and uh, which pairs or, or, or groups of players are under the same uh, ownership or control. So for instance, for instance, if manufacturer and platform are under the same ownership um, or at least share some control. So for instance, the manufacturer has contracted uh, the, the platform to provide the platform services that enables some back channel uh, processes. So for instance, pre-authorization processes uh, that are important to, to uh, describe um, in, in the description of the setup process. And of course, if device and network uh, are um, owned by the same owner, that, that really enables a leap of faith authorization, at least for the network um, access. Another interesting question is, uh, which of these players are being swapped in and out in regular use? So where do we actually have to have uh, processes that go beyond the initial setup and, and repeat some of the installation of authorization information uh, so, for instance, when a device moves between networks, um, that that becomes interesting. Or when a device actually op interoperates with multiple uh, applications, setting up another application may require to do some uh, setup. And one one last interesting flavor is whether physical access implies 
full authorization or what, what other processes do we uh, have to do the equivalent of a factory reset or involuntary ownership uh, transfer. Okay, so th these are a number of uh, questions. Next slide. Um, so what we, we want to do is uh, create terms for uh, some of this, in particular for recurring design patterns, so things we are seeing again and again, and uh, for, for types of identities and types of authorizations that seem to recur. So most of us see things like IDEV IDs and LDEV IDs in, in just about everything we are looking at, uh, and maybe it would be nice to have terms that are um, well-defined and not just one specific uh, solution uh, in this case. And then when we have these terms, we can actually write down um, specifications and, and uh, uh, proposals in these terms. So we record, we could uh, look at FIDO and, and say, okay, FIDO is, is of this flavor and it has uh, these beliefs that are installed at the end of the setup and uh, it is using these uh, processes to, to create uh, these beliefs. So I don't know how how useful this will be for IoT ops. It's, it's probably a slightly more long term view at this and a more researchy uh, view. But if we manage to pull this off, I think it will be very uh, useful to to understand uh, all these uh, uh specifications and proposals that are out there and, and so we can uh, describe a new proposal as that uses flavor x and, and processes y z and a and then everybody knows what they're doing and, and we don't have to to translate between different terms all the time thank you Carsten, quick question do you have a draft on this or is it a proposal for new work basically it's a proposal for new work or maybe a proposal for uh, continuing work on the secure bootstrapping document. So th there's no draft at this point in time. All right, thank you. Um, if people have uh, comments about this specific presentation. I just have one quick question. So Karsten, that means that the work, whether it's a new document or a continuation, would you expect T2 TRG to be the um, the location for the work. Well, that, that from my point of view, that's one of the best things a research group can do is is actually creating a taxonomy. Um, so I think it would be a very good fit. Okay, thanks. So thank you, Carsten. Um, are there any uh, questions with respect to this presentation? The just a second chance to want to get up. If that's not the case, um, Steve, are you prepared for presenting yourself? Or do you want Alexei to uh, present your slides, which is, of course, possible? I um, don't have copies of the slide. Oh, I can see. Present. Um, can Maybe. you please send? Send them to chairs at the end of the session, please, though. They, they should be in the data tracker. Are they now? I, ah. I hope. Fine, magic. Just the time, I think, is the <laughs> magic word here. <laughs> Fine. I'm happy to uh, project them. Okay, Thank Steve. you. Take it away. Sure. So uh, I thought I would share a little bit of uh, information about uh, some things that are going on elsewhere uh, in the industry, uh, which may be useful. Um, next slide. All right. Well, there are many different aspects of uh, IoT operations that are challenging. And here I've tried to describe a few of them. Looks like the slide's getting cut off at the bottom, though. Uh, if it can be sized to fit, that might be a good thing. There we go. Uh, so there are many different 
challenges associated with the operation of IoT devices, and I've highlighted a few of them here. Uh, some of them are in the category of onboarding, uh, some of them in ongoing uh, device management uh, and device maintenance, and some in the category of, uh, well, shall we say device disposition, uh, when the device needs to uh, transition to a new owner, for example. <clears throat> and let me talk about each of these uh, in turn. By the way, I value greatly the work that's uh, being done uh, at NIST and in the T to G R G. Um, and apologies to the extent that this terminology doesn't align with uh, the terminology being used there, but I think it's still very much under development. So with respect to device onboarding, there are several steps that uh, may be needed. Uh, one would be a verification of the device to determine whether it is an authentic and uh, legitimate device that should be onboarded perhaps including the decision as to whether it is one which was anticipated to be onboarded. Then there's the matter of establishing credentials uh, on the device uh, for uh, the device itself that will be recognized, um, and also configuration of the device so that it can operate uh, effectively for whatever application it is to be used for. So this would include configuration not only of security related parameters, but also operational parameters. For example, a light switch being configured with the uh, identity and uh, perhaps uh, addresses of the other switch of the uh, lights that it's going to control. Uh, and uh, network configuration, of course, is a very important part of this as well. Uh, naming can be useful here uh, to the extent that it's desired to have a user visible and readable names uh, for devices and uh, other data about the device. Uh, if it is to be comprehensible to the user, it probably needs to be uh, established at the time that the device is brought on board. Um, and then there's management of the device uh, throughout its operation. But that would include uh, monitoring the device to see if it deviates from normal operational parameters, uh, as well as uh, changing the configuration of the device, even its credentials uh, perhaps may need to change, and uh, certainly uh, authorizations and access control, uh, as well as things that might safely be considered strictly to fall into the management or maintenance category, firmware and software updates to the device. Uh, those are almost inevitable today as uh, we find not only the need for fixing uh, vulnerabilities and other bugs in the device, but also adding features uh, over time. And it's very useful uh, if this can be done in a standard way, as with the rest of these items, uh, the uh, cost of having each the device type have its own methods for onboarding management and maintenance is extraordinary. And uh, yet the techniques that have been previously used for IT systems uh, don't in most cases apply. Finally, disposition of the device, uh, whether it is to be uh, resold or reused in another location, gifted to someone, or uh, scheduled for destruction or recycling. Uh, this is an important stage in the life cycle of the device. And uh, one has to make sure that proper consideration is given, for example, to removing sensitive data and credentials that are on the device so that it can't be uh, then used 
uh, in order to in insinuate itself back into the original operational environment or to extract confidential information from the device. So all of these and probably others as well are uh, real uh, challenges for IoT operation. And as was described earlier, the challenges vary depending on the type of environment where the IoT device is to be used, whether it's a home or business or uh, government entity, the requirements in terms of ease of use and security will change as well. The next slide. I'd like to tell you a little bit about a project connected home over IP. And you might say, well, you know, we have so many IoT communication standards and IoT standards in general. Why should uh, one be uh, more of interest than others? And I'll try to describe that. Um, the reason that I think it's especially important. It is, of course, an effort to create some widely supported IoT communication standards to reuse as many as possible and create whatever else is needed to support those uh, the normal operation of the device throughout its life cycle. It's intended to run over any media that supports IP, uh, but the first priorities are Wi-Fi, thread, and Bluetooth low energy. And the focus is on smart home, not to say that commercial applications may not come into focus in future releases, but the members of the CHIP, as we call it, a uh, working group in the Zigbee Alliance include more than 180 companies with many market leaders, uh, companies like Apple, Amazon, Google, Samsung, uh, uh, Signify and others, um, and uh, they're all actively involved in and committed to the uh, development of these standards. Intellectual property has been contributed and uh, will be made available on a royalty-free basis to anyone. The working group is only open to Zigbee members, uh, but the open source implementation and the specification will be open to all and uh, in fact already are um, so if you want more information on it, you go to this website here connectedhomeip.com next slide so why do people uh, feel this is necessary well why do the members feel that it's necessary Consumers are frustrated uh, with the current smart home situation. They want more from their homes and from these products uh, than they're able to get today. Uh, setting up the home, the smart home is too complicated, uh, often not secure, uh, paradoxically, and uh, incompatible in that many different ecosystems have their own set of proprietary protocols for uh, onboarding and operation of these devices. And so CHIP aims to deliver a, uh, a better experience to the consumer uh, from the start to the finish, not just at onboarding, and for manufacturers as well, so that they don't have to support uh, proprietary standards, multiple proprietary standards, a single set of standards should suffice. It will even enable interoperability on a peer-to-peer -peer basis among uh, devices, regardless of whether they're on the same uh, network medium, uh, so long as there's IP connectivity between them. Uh, and security, strong security is an absolute uh, requirement for chip from the start. So we aim to reuse as many other standards as possible. Next slide. So the typical chip onboarding process uh, looks as follows. The user brings their new device home. Uh, they scan a Q 
QR code on the device and press a button to notify the device that it should be uh, listening for an introduction um, and onboarding. At that point, the steps that I described earlier of verification of the device and uh, provisioning of the device with the necessary uh, credentials and other configuration data are performed and the device is able to connect to the home network without the user needing to enter any additional data such as uh, network uh, passwords or SSIDs or anything like that. And that's regardless of whether it's a Wi-Fi or a uh, thread device, 802.15.4. And uh, it will automatically be configured as well with the information uh, about other devices that it needs to connect with. And those other devices then able to find this device uh, so that uh, they can control it if they have the permissions to do so. Next slide. So this slide simply illustrates the different network media that may be used and how they may interconnect. So uh, we see uh, Wi-Fi in use within the home, as well as uh, other uh, low power networks such as thread uh, that might be in use. Uh, it's especially important to have uh, networks that are suitable for uh, smart home devices, not just to assume that everybody can use a Wi-Fi network. Uh, many of these uh, tiny uh, devices operating with energy harvesting or with very small batteries and long lifetimes can't use Wi-Fi, um, and yet they can still use IP uh, so long as we support uh, Thread or uh, BLE. I'm sure there'll be other media supported later as well. And uh, this being uh, IoT, uh, connectivity to the cloud uh, is enabled by IP, although it's not required. You can go up to your mountain cabin and no external connectivity whatsoever and set up a chip network up there if you want. Next slide. So what's included here uh, in CHIP, a set of standard communications protocols that run at the application layer uh, across any IP network. Uh, there are practical considerations uh, that mean that some custom handling for BLE thread and Wi-Fi are useful and so CHIP includes that. Uh, I would say that in working with this group, uh, I find that the practical experience of the group members is quite valuable. They know where the pitfalls lie. The difference between theory and practice has been hard learned over the years. Uh, next slide. The open source uh, reference implementation for CHIP uh, provides software that anyone can use designed for port of maximum portability uh, to uh, pretty much anywhere, har any hardware or operating system. Next slide. And uh, we do take care to address all of these. Uh, I won't have time today to get into how uh but uh you can take a look at the specification uh to learn that uh next slide oh that's my yeah here's my last uh we expect our specs to be published soon in the next few months at least the initial drafts and aim to have product shipping by the end of the calendar year and uh would welcome any collaborations with other standards groups such as IETF, either by a formal liaison agreement or uh, through joint membership, as we have here today. Uh, and uh, uh, if not, 
if there's not interest on the IETF side, then we can just maintain the status quo and keep each other informed about what we're doing. That's it for my presentation. Any questions? Okay. If not, thank you for your time. All right. Thank you very much. So this is Hank. Next up uh, is uh, the presentation by Michael Richardson. Michael, are you with us still again? Well, you're muted. I now see you at the participant list. So, Michael, assuming you're not a ghost participant, you're still muted. I was talking to Michael in Java, but I'm not sure whether he can just see stuff, but not necessarily talk. So. The technology really is great. And Michael <laughs> says he cannot find a mute on his tiny screen. Oh, that's an interesting new problem. <laughs> I can unmute you, Michael. I should say no. I can't. Oh, dang it! I can only mute. That is not uh, a useful thing. Okay. If you put it in, um, if you put it in a uh, portrait mode, then you can see the unmute. But if you turn it to a more, much more usable landscape mode, then oh, the mute button disappears, uh, is hidden if you unless you poke it or not. So okay, I don't know if I turn my camera on. I didn't or not. I kind of didn't intend to. Uh, your camera is on. You don't need your, your camera. camera. And me? Well, if you can see me, great. And if you can't, tough. Um. All right, so I just wanted to talk a couple minutes about um, this. I guess it's really good. We're actually all, without really preparing, we're kind of all on the same uh, topic here, particularly uh, Karsten, Tim, and I. Um, so I wanted to talk about the issue of device and certificate life cycles and management. Next slide, please. So RFC 8576, which is deals with current issues in IoT, um, has this really nice diagram, um, this ASCII art diagram. And um, let me get rid of the stupid. No, that's not the right word. Uh, has this really nice, and I want to talk about. I've highlighted some of the colors of some of the pieces, and I want to talk about that blue orange section called operating and the, the bit of the red part. So, you know, we've talked about onboarding and commissioning, and you know, that's my common favorite uh, topic. But um, let's talk a little bit about something that comes after it, which is operations. And um, I want you to think about a little bit, and it's not so much in terms of the smart home as Steve has described. Um, Although there is a fairly par important part of that in the smart home, but I want you to think of it as somewhere as a multi-tenant building, a smart building where there's a, a, a multitude of tenants. The foyer, for instance, um, is used by all sorts of tenants. The front door needs to be lockable by everybody um, and unlockable by emergency services. Um, and over time, there's different uh, occupants who occupy different pieces of the building. Um, and not only that, but there's also possible sub sub lease uh, arrangements um, that can happen um, as and, and sometimes for as little as you know a few hours even if if you think about common uh, boardrooms and things like that if we're ever allowed to have those kinds of things again in the future um, where the building actually has some space that is used you know by one company or another company for a little while and it, it comes back and um, 
And I'm just going to mention that in the smart home, we haven't encountered this, and, I, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from Chip as to how this is going to work. Um, but when I bought my new home, and it's coming up on exactly 20 years ago, the first thing we did was we went out, took all the tumblers to the hardware store, and got the whole home re-keyed, literally re-keyed. Um, and I have the same key for all three doors, which is wonderful, which the previous owner did not have. Um, but how do I do that for my IoT devices? I need to do that somehow. And um, I think that's a critical thing, and we have to build it in upfront. We can't, we can't wait for someone to go, oh, wait, um, how do I change the key? So next slide, please. So right now, we know who owns what essentially by the fact that we have some kind of an owner. Um, in Brewski, it's a registrar, and it signs an LDEV ID for each device. Um, and it appears that, that, that FIDO's IoT does something like this, and, and, I, and I guess CHIP does a certain amount of this. I'm unclear if it's a certificate or symmetric key or not. Uh, police authority is actually very much like uh, uh, Intel SDO, but I don't know exactly the details, and they have a lot of IPR claims that that means I don't want to read their specs. Um, and But essentially, everyone has some kind of cryptographic identity that, that says which device is owned by whom. And I think that's a pretty good model, and I don't think I'm going to propose to change it, but I think we need to think of this all the way through. Next slide, please. So... On the other side of things, you ask the question is which device is which? And LDEV ID is actually really good for that. And you can actually use it in, in uh, 802.1x with WP Enterprise, for instance, to onboard. And that is a really good and is a way better solution than a WPA key. And one of the reasons that it's a better solution is uh, because of Mac randomization. So it turns out that there's some interesting tricks and, and simplifications with WPA PSK where in most cases you can actually assign a per device WPA uh, um, key, but only if you know the MAC address. If the, MAC, if the device comes in with a randomized MAC address, then you have this problem of you actually don't know what key to look up to figure out what, how to authenticate it until you've, you've figured it all out. And since you don't transmit the key over the wire, you can't use that as a thing. This is actually, if you're familiar with IP1 with main mode, um, and uh, PSKs, it's it's very similar problem there. So and it goes away with certificates because you can do asymmetric signatures and, and those can be proven. So if you throw MAC randomization, which the Medina's working group is about to embark into, then you suddenly discover that you really can't use MAC addresses, and that mostly eliminates the ability to have a per device WP um, PSK. You think, oh, well, well, why do I need a per device uh, this? And the answer is because you have to be able to, the only way to kick it, uh, mal, uh, a misbehaving device off the network is to revoke their key. Um, and if you want to change the ownership of the devices and who has access to the network, then the only way to do that is to reach in and change their PSK again. And that changes what network they can go on and change the SSID. And also it restricts that they can't be on the old network anymore. Um, and so that's pretty important, and I think that we need to get we get, need to get past this PSK stuff, even in the home, um, and we need to move aggressively to identifying devices by certificates. Now there are some privacy issues there, um, and it depends on the protocol exactly what happens. Um, and I but I think we need to sit down and write them down. And it may be that WPA3 with TLS 1.3 solves 90% of the privacy issues, but it might be that we have some additional issues that we need to do, and it, we might need to do things like um, I was thinking about uh, S key like or Merkle chain like, uh, where where you make you know a thousand hashes of of a, a secret, or in this case, this the the certificate hash, and since they're all hashed that way, you can't tell who, who and what's what. But you can reveal the hashes one by one, the way that S key did. Um, if you can very old RFC to look up, um, and that may actually let you do things like show, say yes, in fact, that you are supposed to be part of this network, or this is this is in fact uh, you are identified to me, even though you haven't you haven't shown your identity. Um, next slide, please. So assuming we can we can accomplish this. And we can get the privacy implications of the certificates and the LDEV IDs everywhere done. Then we can change ownership in an orderly fashion. It's essentially the same as changing a CA. Um, and 
th essentially the process is that the old owner signs the new owner and uh, uh, that, that makes it the process rolls over quite nicely and then the own owner old owner stops signing the devices and the uh, stop signing the new owner and the devices seamlessly migrate from one to the other and that's the kind of thing that you expect to do in a building in a multi-tenant building for instance where um in most cases there the ownership changes quite orderly um and uh even predictable um and so we just have to figure out how we're going to process this because right now with enrollment processes the device mostly reaches out to the registrar to renew their certificates. And so we need to decide whether we want to continue that in some kind of a polled mechanism or whether we need to invert the process as is being done in, for instance, in the NetMod working group, um, NetMod, NetComp, um, uh, where in fact a management system is reaching out via Yang and extracting a new CSR um, and then pushing a new certificate back. Um, so those are two different choices, and I think we need to actually uh, decide which one we're going to do, and, and we need to write a, a BCP that says, how do you do this there? Next slide, please. So now we get into the other problem. Oh, well, disorderly, or a flash, as they sometimes call it, changes of ownership. So that new, in this case, the device has a new owner, and the old owner is perhaps not cooperation, cooperative or perhaps they simply don't exist. Um, so sometimes that's because the CA is gone, just died and they can't get a new one and they have to restart everything. And today that certainly involves going and resetting every device um, and redoing the onboarding. And then the question arises, well, is that authorized, right? In a multi-tenant environment, if someone can go around pushing the buttons, uh, and re, uh, onboarding devices, and that's a problem. Um, and that's probably a problem in your home if your guests can wander up behind your smart speaker, push the reset button, and onboard the device again, okay? Um, and so how would you prevent it, or how would you at least detect it? And this is something that um, I think we really, really need to, to work out. Finally, there's the other, the final thing. Well, what if the devices have to continue to operate um, while they're being um, having their ownership changed. Um, and we hope that, that mostly we can deal with the fact that automobiles and ventilators don't need to do this, or they can continue to do their primary function even while their management functions are being disconnected or, or redone. Um, or we just you know can swap in a different ventilator after it's, it's been changed its owner's owner. And we can then take the other one offline and and you know uh, uh, do push the right buttons and do the right things. Um, and that may work for a quite a number of devices where you can have n plus one spares and things like this. But there may be some things that this doesn't work well for. Um, and I'm the one major one I'm thinking about is elevators. Um, I mean, I wouldn't want to have all my elevators go offline for half an hour, and that's usually not the case in a building. Usually they have more than one bank of elevators. And they have separate control systems, so they can only put always put some in maintenance in some way while some of them are operating. Um, but if they're all tied together in some intelligent way, and you're trying to redo the management system, that's maybe is a real problem. And I think there's a, a whole class of devices that we're going to discover um, that we really they do need to operate in some continuous fashion um, compare in the compared to the timeline of re. I don't know what what the right word is, reparenting them or something like this occurs, right? Um, perhaps your furnace, you think, well, I can survive for half an hour while it's on, it's reparented to a new device. That's okay. But can I survive the whole weekend if it's, you know, waiting for um, uh, uh, Monday morning for the furnace company to say, uh, oh, yes, we agree that we are now your new furnace management company. And the answer is probably uh, in at least my my neck of the woods. Um, you know, you can't survive the whole weekend on in January that way. Um, and I think that's almost the last slide. Next slide probably just says questions. Is there one? No, there we go. Yeah. So that's really the questions, right? What are we going to do? Are we going to do long lived certificates with frequent checking? Are we going to do short lived certificates, always renewing, um, some kind of a push mechanism, um, and can we really deal with, uh, um, uh, can we really revive the enterprise CA um, such that we can actually put it in essentially every dwelling and or major, you know, uh, minor or major building um, there? 
that's really it. And I'm open to discussion here. Let's figure out how to turn the video off. Uh, grid. So thank you, Michael. Um, I hope you're not struggling with your video. I did not see a video, <laughs> but maybe. Uh, apparently, I managed to turn the video on and off again. Okay. Yeah, so uh, um, we have uh, scheduled a little bit of uh, after uh, open mic time to uh, ponder the actual content presented today. So if uh, there were no immediate questions beforehand, so for now, I would like to throw at least one question to the ring and then see how that works. Um, this was, uh, um, oh, and there's, sorry, I will just <laughs> step down for everybody who's queuing right now. Thank you for the queuing here. And I see the chat. Warren was in first, and I'm opening up a mic line now, therefore. Oh, so Warren, thanks. Oops, sorry, thanks. Yeah, this is Warren No Hats, obviously. Um, so a lot of these things sound like we're trying to mitigate problems that users don't currently have. Um, you know, the coordinated handover of devices, etc. Um, currently, you know, users don't need to worry about what happens if a CA that their device eventually chains up through goes away because their devices don't. And I think something we need to keep in mind is we have to somehow make sure that whatever happens with IoT stuff, the user doesn't feel that the device is getting worse and harder to use. Um, and I realize, you know, we were all keeping this in mind. It's just while listening to this, I kept thinking um, Michael's example of a furnace um, and it can't being off being offline for a few days because of change of ownership or change of who runs it. Um, I don't currently have that problem. And I think it would be a sad world if we ended up in a place where that becomes the norm. Um, it's not actually a useful question, more of a philosophical rant slash soapbox. Thank you. So uh, Elliot is up next. Um, if Michael wants to go in front of me to, to just tackle that point, I'd, I'd be happy to defer. Yeah, um, so Warren, um, I'm going to guess you have a dumb furnace like me, um, and I'm going to keep mine dumb until such time as the problem is solved. Um, I do know people that have smart furnaces, and they have this problem today. They just don't know that they have this problem. Right, and and we see this in in here. There's a list called dumpster fire. We see this regularly um, with um, all sorts of devices that do not have proper things. And I think that you know th this is you know the, you know the the old adage you know uh, uh, the, the the quandary you know can God make a rock so big that he can't move it, right? Um, and one of the answers is you know God is wise enough to never do that, um, and. And I think that in this group, in the IETF, we are wise enough to never buy into technology that um, doesn't have these problems. And that's why we personally don't have these problems. But there's a lot of people out there that um, aren't that wise and do have this problem today. And in many cases, it's going to bite them uh, at two, four in the morning on a, on a weekend morning when they suddenly discover that it's not possible for them to turn their furnace back on. Okay, maybe I can proceed if, if that's okay, unless, um, uh, Hank, is it okay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay thanks. Um, first, uh, thanks to all the presenters. Um, that was really um, enjoyable. Um, let me get my camera going to just prove that I'm really enjoying it. See, look, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying. Um, and I have a question for Steve Hanna about uh, the Connected Home IP Alliance work. Um, as in one of the slides, uh, you indicated that there's this button that needs to be pushed in order to do the onboarding. Um, does the specification take into account the possibility there, that there might not be a 
button to push or is that a requirement of chip? No, it's permitted. You can have other ways of uh, performing, initiating that uh, provisioning process. There, that was my question. Easy enough, huh? <laughs> Thanks. So I would like to point out that Warren commented on some of this on the chat, so that it's not always uh, catching someone's eye. I mean, I wouldn't actually call it a rant, to be honest. But uh, um, personally, and this is saying without a head on effectively uh, getting into the line here. Um, I, I think that there's, there's somehow there is always a theme between these presentations, and then again, I think it's it's relatively hard to derive a a, a for, for example what, what Michael said a BCP from that. So and 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 you also mentioned this uh, in the chat right now. So so that, that is something um, that I would like to take on with with the uh, questions from from Michael at the end. Um, how how to take this? By way, when you when you phrase these questions, did you had a, a approach in mind that you would uh, um, because it's like like doing this or the other? It's like it's like you have to decide. So is it a decision tree model or do we do we really want to set a decision here? So that, that that's what I'm I'm personally wondering because I I'm left a little bit uh, yeah uh, with an open question and and that is I think somehow the the opposite of of a a common idea that we all agree on, right? Um, well, um, so I think that um, there's two parts here, is that um, we need to understand whether we understand the problem well. Um, and the second part is that we need to, dis to figure out whether we like to have um, the uh, w what is the model of the solution? So um, there's there's a number of different ways in which we can do it. I mean, we had a uh, had a conversation, for instance, about um, a couple of weeks ago in uh, uh, sort of on the lamps list about um, whether there's a way in which other than a certificate expiry, because that's not really what we want to do. Whether we could convince devices to check back in with their EST servers, for instance. Um, um, sooner, um, such that we could, in fact, issue multi-decade long certificates because that's what we think the operational uh, 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 requirements are, but still actually have the devices check in once a week to find out if, if everything's okay and whether they should get a new certificate because something's happened. Um, and, um, you know, that might be a, a one-page RFC um to to define a, a new header that describes what that polling period is um or it might be just that we have a conversation about well the work that's been done in netcom and we say that you know what devices need to support um an https target that supports uh yang rpc um and well that sentence pretty sounds pretty trivial to say the, imp the impl implementation requirements um may be quite steep um, because it implies a whole bunch of other stuff, like that the certificate on the device is, in fact, uh, somehow um, validatable um, by the uh, management system, which we assume is the case, but isn't always. Um, and so there's a whole process there that we need to make sure that it happens uh, there. Which is difficult to operationalize, but maybe we come back to this later. Elliot is in the uh, queue again. Sorry, and I realized that I left my uh, camera going. I'll, I'll kill it after this. Um, yeah, I think uh, there there are different classes of of devices, but what what I think um, what I what I enjoyed about your presentation, Michael, is this non cooperative mode, if you will, in terms of device. You know, it, it, you could assume maybe that a house was foreclosed or a business went bankrupt. These are things that were raised. If we if we think back uh, to the for the the last call of Bruski, uh, uh, some of these things were raised then. And um, the ramifications here aren't just that you might lose certain functionality in some cases, but that other people retain that functionality when you don't want them to. And so 
just a, a, a small document on that, I don't know if it's a blog or whatever, to explain the ramifications of not handling handoffs is um, I think useful. And then what the, you know, what sort of parameters there are to even, how do you even know the thing was sold? And what, you know, what does it mean ownership in this context? Um, these are, I think, challenging points. And well, if we, if we look at things like, you know, sort of devices without pre-built in trust anchors beyond say, a uh, public key a la, you know, DPP or whatever chip is delivering in this regard. Um, that, that, that to me, I think uh, has certain uh, benefits, but, uh, and I think it also addresses Warren's concern and it may be something we, we may even want to take a position on uh, at some point. I mean, figuring out for certs is hard in this case, right? It may not be in, improper in other cases, by the way, it may be proper to use a certificate based approach when you have a really high value asset that need, that really ought to have been tracked by the manufacturer, assuming the manufacturer survives, which is another question. But those are some thoughts we can put into a document even. So thank you, Elliot, for, for basically the segue. Yes, and that is, I think, a good point in time to uh, use the uh, 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 small steering <laughs> topic that we have called phrasing and scoping of deliverables, because here in this working group, we are basically uh, tasked with creating a set of well, work items, I would say, um, that we can capture in the scope of documents. And so my, my very naive first question to the participants here right now, uh, and of course we will continue and extend this discussion to the list, would be, uh, is there a, a good idea or does one have a good idea to, to scope a first work items that you want to happen or see happen here right now? So I guess I'll, I'll throw out the um, the document idea that I just that I just gave you. You yeah. heard me chuckle uh, just because of what Karsten just tossed in the chat, which is key escrow, because you know obviously the computer industry has warred over that exact phrase when we start thinking about um, who's doing the escrow. But it, it's an interesting idea to at least ponder for a moment. So, Clipper, then? What, what I wanted to, to say is that um, whatever we do in terms of involuntary uh, ownership transfer uh, will have at least some of the interesting properties that we didn't want uh, when, when key escrow was uh, discussed. Um, so I think it, it's a really interesting problem how to do involuntary transfer uh, in a way that, that avoids at least some of the uh, problems. So, so I actually propose we write a document then, and I think involuntary, uh, involuntary device transfer or transfer of ownership. What was the word you used? Just I missed it, Karsten. I think that's a really good document, and I think that we it should have a it should be a discussion about the um, you know pros and cons. Maybe never to be published as an RFC, but I think that's a document that we should write um, and and figure out what the boundaries are. Um, and maybe it's actually something that actually you know NIST actually want, would prefer to to take over in some way, um, because I think there's aspects of regulation and uh, legal inputs to this um, that really need to be taken into account. Thanks, Michael. And uh, be I before, we, Sorry? Be before we hand this over to, to the lawyers, um, <laughs> I think we, we should do some brainstorming whether there's something that can be done that is at least slightly better than, than key escrow. 
Um, and um, then if, if we de have decided that's about as good as we, we will get, we can send this over to, to the lawyers and, and the, the other bodies that, are, that will be part of the regulation world that will be needed to make this happen. But if we, if we let them invent the, the mechanism, uh, that might be as good as key as well. I, I I think I would support having the uh, the technologists having the uh, the the uh, things happen in public as much as possible until you get to the limits of what technology can do, um, and then the pieces outside of that. You know, I think we're all going to just uh, cover our eyes and pray. Um, but uh, but I, I would certainly support solving the solutions, uh, solving the problems as much as possible in this kind of a venue. Yeah, so that's what I had in mind. I wasn't intending to to write a document for for lawyers, but rather to create a palette of different mechanisms. But from the one side is key escrow, okay, and uh, and on the other side is, uh, yeah, just push this button, right? Um, and I I think there's a bunch of sc scenarios in between, um, and there's you know uh you know it comes you know there's there's many devices that you can get where you can convince the manufacturer to help you recover um and then there's devices you know where for instance apple has said that they won't help you recover right um and i think that that palette needs to be described from a technical point of view um and then i think that once we've said what's possible um then i think it comes back to um uh regulators or 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 um uh I industry self-governing things to decide you know well this is an appropriate level of uh security versus paranoia versus um compromise because of of call it national cyber uh security issues um so i mean we all want the devices the manufacturers all want to make it easy for the devices to be uh quickly uh recovered um and the nash the nations all want to make sure that that's not abused en masse right um or that uh that there aren't any too many cross jurisdictional boundaries uh on that process uh that it matters i want to uh, um uh present the mic to to spencer who was waiting patiently in line for quite a while now you still want to uh, be at the mic line? Uh, thank you. Um, so I had uh, two observations that I thought were make worth making. Uh, the first one is if I was going to try to do a BCP on this, I would try to do the outline of what it is you're trying to do first, and then go back and fill in how you're how you're going to do it. Uh, that might that might that that format of the work might give an opportunity for uh, a considered discussion about different alternatives uh, and then say, you know, the and the winner is um, whether, uh, you know, just to, just to be able to move that that work forward. Uh, the other thing was, I, this is me personally, but I think it's perf perfectly fine for a BCP to say, these are some um, these are some these are some problems that we don't have a good solution for now, or you know we don't have a good solution for now that does not involve key escrow, which we see pr as problematic, or what you know whatever the whatever the thing is. But I think that's a perfectly fine thing to say in a BCP. Uh, the other thing is. Uh, I think you guys are headed towards something that really needs to be published as an RFC uh, because it's going to be uh, something that people are going to want to reference in other SDOs and even perhaps in uh, regulatory environments. So, you know, wiki pages are great, but maybe not for that. Thanks, Spencer. So, uh, again, I think the line has Warren in it right now. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that Spencer said almost everything I wanted to. Um, I think 
sort of talking about stuff like, you know, key escrow versus a reset button might currently be a bit premature because I think we first need something that describes more of what, not quite problem statement and requirements, but more sort of what we're talking about and how we think that things fit together. Um, right, like what do we actually mean by secure onboarding, um, et cetera. So I think more sort of a overview architecture and then it can go more into the detailed parts, but that's just my view. It's not, you know, no hats. So I'm just uh, highlighting the Doug on the on the in the chat uh, asked the question: Should secure onboarding be something users can opt in or opt out of, or is an inherent property of the device or the usage itself? So just just throwing this in here, unless uh, maybe some people do not pay attention to the chat. Actually, and Elliot, okay. Um, I think there's a phrase that we like to use, which is secure by design. And of course, everybody bickers about what the word secure means, right? We, we, we love to do that. But um, what I'll tell you what I think we shouldn't do. I don't think we should be aiming the society and the industry towards solutions that, um, that, that require outs of security, right? We don't want to have what amounts to downgrade attacks. And um, so uh, in my view, right, it should be secure by default. Onboarding should be a, a process that can, can, can always happen in a secure way. Transfers should always happen in a secure way. We should set the North Star and not, you know, it, as much as I have some corner cases for Rich on his, um, on, on his uh, out, outlawing of uh, subject names, uh, uh, draft in, in Utah, I have a lot of sympathy for his direction and totally support that that aspect. So we always want to set the North Star in this regard. And we don't have to worry about laggards at this point because we're all laggards at the moment. We want to get away from that. So, and Alexei, I think you uh, also commented on the list. Maybe we are, want to speak up here. Uh... So to speak at the mic. Yes, so I was asking, so uh, Michael, you proposed at least one topic to work on. Uh, are you volunteering to co-edit? Who else is interested? Um, I will certainly be involved. Um, and I, 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 I like Spencer's notion and I need to, to I need to listen to what he said again, actually, um, uh, because I'm not really sure. I'm not say I don't think I'm particularly sure how to organize the document, but um, um, it's got me thinking. A couple of showers, and maybe I'll have figured it out. Sounds like a plan of a plan. So uh, this is Hank uh, commenting on on the content of that. So um, I think what was the term actor or oh, player? Sorry, player. So so Carsten introduced the term uh, uh, player before then. So so um, the owner or so, so the in air quotes owner I guess are players here, but sometimes you have to involve some other governing entity that helps you transition a device. So so when we do work here, what, what my recommendation would be is to uh, to look to to identify to to name these parties and maybe again I was using air quotes when I said owner, because maybe it's it's just the overseeing body as as was highlighted at somewhere else and that that might be an interesting distinction. So when when we do something here, uh, so when we can contest and play with this these these names that we can agree on and and see how how uh, if they fill some gap or or not so that would be just a a comment when when something starts that that uh, please keep in mind there might be other uh, work that will uh, accompany this and then we have to reuse that and make it consistent so i, I hope that's that's something we can achieve here and uh, well, we have to start with the first document and let's find out
Are there any other, so I haven't paid attention to the chat, sorry, I have to move there. I'm using a, 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 a mobile device also right now, so that's a little bit difficult, but I think the mic line is empty now, and we have at least a document that could become something that is worked on here uh, for the voluntary ownership change. Um, is there anything else that someone wants to bring up here in the context, or we can, of course, bring that topic to the list? And Elliot, please go ahead. Uh, just on the voluntary ownership change thing for, for a moment, one aspect that um, we might want to consider is whether it should be necessary in some environments to test that there is at least possession of the device in some way, shape, or form. Right, so you know, is that per, does that person still have possession of the device, and and how do you test, and what are the ramifications if the test fails, and you know, these these are things we might want to ask as we pursue this ac activity. So when someone steals your car, they have a possession of it, right? Yes, but the, 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 what I'm more thinking of is suppose <laughs> su suppose the car. What's the difference between stealing the car and having the car having been repossessed? And what's the difference in, in the case of a house versus a furnace in the house versus the thermostat in the house? And how do I know, for instance, to shut off the data feed to the app that's on the phone of the previous owner? And the control function too. Yes, um, and there's an additional bit that I think needs to go into this. Um, and, and there was a really good talk in 2019, I guess it was, at the IOTSF a keynote about spouse about uh, ex spouse abuse, um, but by a control. IoT devices, and it's often the case after breakup. And so that's an interesting case of involuntary ownership transfer. It's my device, but you can control it now after we broke up. So thank you, Michael. Um, we are uh, basically five minutes before the top of the hour, and um, these uh, call for 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 content items or work items uh, we will uh, put to the list, of course, and uh, the minutes will follow. Uh, and I think uh, thank you for the minutes taken. I thank you a lot for the extensive minutes taken. So that looks really uh, comprehensive to me. And we will, what, we will work through that. And, what, um, what's the conclusion with Karsten's uh, presentation in non? I don't know if there, there was no um, doc exactly attached to it. So, so one of the uh, takeaways I personally noted was that uh, um, the question from Tim about where would these taxonomies go? And that was basically answered by Karsten with the, with the thing to thing research group. A research group would be a good place for that. But making use of taxonomies here, of course, uh, makes sense when we reuse the uh, appropriate uh, labels that have been placed there. there. So, what, Karsten, maybe you have something to add to this? So, of course, uh, I, I would like to discuss this with the, the authors of the current. Uh, documents as well, so we can come up with an arrangement uh, that that um, makes sense. But uh, we we have a variety of mechanisms we can use to to get these documents out, and internet drafts is one. And, and uh, uh, of course, we also have uh, wikis where we collect uh, collect some terminology and so on. Um, so we we will have to find out how to do that. And uh, I I could imagine that. Uh, we we develop a relationship uh, that, that is a bit of a client server nature. So IoT Ops uh, tells us uh, where terminology is actually needed, um, and uh, uh, the research group actually tries to define that uh, terminology. Um, 
but uh, yeah, in the end, it's all going to be people who who will will be uh, to a large part in both groups. So I think it's not even necessary to to define this uh, in, in a particular detailed way. Yeah, and Michael also said that a document uh, can be useful to capture ideas and contents, I think, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to become an RFC. So that is also I th a very good message so in order to structure and, and move forward uh, with work here and, and structure the plan accordingly. I think, I think gathering information in drafts is a good uh, initial process, of course. And yes, nothing, uh, not everything that we have to, we were creating here has, become, has to become a, a published document in the end. Um, uh, so, so it is fine to, to, to basically uh, uh, create uh, documents that you deliberately intend not to publish. seen, for example, with the use cases documents sometimes in other working groups. Okay, that said, is there's a last chance to speak up now, uh, as we have two minutes left here. If that is not the case, I would really thank everybody uh, to to stay with us due to all this technical snuff at the very beginning of the session. Again, I hope really that is somehow due to my settings and not due to a new feature of WebEx. Uh, having said that, we will explore the uh, option to use a media echo in the near future uh, when we try to do this again. And so again, thank you everybody for joining us here. Uh, thank you for adding a blue sheet uh, list to the minutes. Uh, I cross check that that looks good. Maybe cross check that yourself if you think you're missing there. Um, um, I did not mention that at the very beginning, but that worked out well, thank you. And so um, Alexei, do you have something else to say in the last? Uh... No, pretty much I want to uh, second uh, your call. Thank you for coming. And... Thank you for having a productive meeting. Indeed. Hope to see you soon at the very latest at the next IHF meeting, virtual wise. Thanks. Thanks all. Thank you all.